Hello, everybody. Welcome to this uh, web-based lecture on the management of relapsed large cell lymphoma in the era of CAR-T cell therapy. Um, I'm a associate professor at University of Minnesota, and I lead the CAR-T cell program here. Feel free to uh, send me the questions. When you click on a question mark icon, you can type the question, and we can uh, re uh, review those at the end of presentation. Otherwise, um, I hope you, you, you enjoy it. So the goal, uh, these, these are my uh, disclosures. The goal of this lecture is to uh, review the biology of a large cell lymphoma and especially the concept uh, of a CAR-T cell therapy for this disease and evolving um, landscape of, of where the CAR-T fits uh, in context. Uh, I am going to review uh, and I want you to learn the indications for CAR T cell therapy for patients with aggressive B cell lymphoma. Uh, there are some algorithms and selection criteria which we will, going, we will review. And then I am going to spend some time on uh, understanding and describing the role of bridging therapy and timing of CAR T cell therapy to augment the successful outcome. So we'll start with a case. This is a, a typical or usual case of a relapse lymphoma. So it's a 54 years old man who was diagnosed in large cell lymphoma stage 4B when he presented with a supraclavicular adenopathy. The uh, biopsy showed large cell lymphoma and the immunohistochemistry confirmed a germinal cell D subtype. He had a high LDH and a skeletal and marrow involvement uh, which uh, put him in a high IPI given the extra nodal disease. The patient was treated with the arch of chemotherapy, the frontline treatment, and initially experienced reduction. But at the end of a treatment, the PET scan showed new metabolically active disease in the right lobe of the liver. This was uh, confirmed by biopsy as a, a new site of the disease. The patient has a primary refractory lymphoma. He subsequently received two cycles of a salvage chemotherapy with the rice, but only had a brief response lasting for a couple of weeks. And as he was preparing for the autologous transplant, he had a rapidly growing supraclavicular adenopathy. So just to review quickly the natural history of a large cell lymphoma, this is the most common lymphoma. About a third of the patients have this histology. Current standard of care in around the world is RCHOP21. The vast majority of these patients, over uh, two thirds are cured with this treatment. But for patients who are primary refractory, they have a very poor outcome. Now, just to review a couple of uh, novel uh, terminologies in a WHO for this disease, and we'll go quickly through this. Now uh, we need to pay attention to a subsetting of the large cell lymphoma to two uh, main subtypes, uh, germinal central B cell and activated B cell. And then there is a special entity in WHO now, T cell histiocytic recharge B cell lymphoma, which was often excluded or it was excluded from the pivotal trials which uh, were designed for the relapse uh, refractory large cell lymphoma for the CAR T cell therapy. So here is how we are diagnosing the GCB versus ABC in the routine practice by immunohistochemistry. And, and of course, we are all aware by, uh, we are all aware of using the fluorescent in C2 polarization method to look for the translocation on a CMIC gene, which is associated with the uh, translocations of a BCL6 and BCL2. And this defines this new entity, which is called uh, double or triple hit. And uh, this is important because they are prognostic for chemoimmunotherapy, but I'm going to review some data how significant or insignificant this is when we are applying the CAR T cell treatment to these patients. So there are other disease entities, just a high grade B cell lymphoma NOS or unclassifiable with the features intermediate between large cell and classical Hodgkin lymphoma. So these are a subsets of large cell lymphoma as we learn that this heterogeneous disease in fact comprise many different subsets. So this is a, really the uh, most modern study uh, 
which involved patients with lateral lymphoma of all, of all different subtypes uh, in a, a cooperative group in the US and uh, compared our CHOP with a dose adjusted our EPOC for all comers and demonstrated that there is no difference in outcome. So our job is still remaining a frontline therapy. And our EPOC is only used for a selective group based upon a phase two data, particularly double hit, double expressor, or high aggressive lymphomas. So here is another case which we talk about. So this is the same case, uh, primary refractory disease. So we can ask what is the chance for this patient to be cured with the currently available therapies? And particularly, what is the outcome if he is getting another line of salvage therapy? So the answer is provided. Uh, one of the studies which uh, is useful when we are trying to answer this question is a scholar one study. It's a retrospective analysis looking at over 600 patients uh, with a real refractory lateral lymphoma, which were treated with a chemoimmunotherapy. So subsequent another third or fourth salvage therapy uh, and for those who are in remission subsequent transplant. So that uh, population which was uh, studied in this cohort are patients who had a frontline therapy and were refractory, those who had relapse disease and received salvage but again had, pro had pro uh, aggressive disease or stable disease or those patients with autologous transplant and relapse less than 12 months. So they are, these are called refractory lateral lymphoma. And when you look at the outcomes uh, with this cohort, only very small um, number of patients, 7% uh, were able to get a CR. And this is what you need to really be uh, able to have a successful transplant. The PR uh, response rate was 18% with an overall response rate of 26%. And here are the numbers for the primary refractory, only 3% CRs uh, after salvage, 10% CRs, and relapse post oil slightly better, 15% CRs. But when you look at the survival, indeed, the overall survival from commencement of salvage chemotherapy is poor with a median uh, time to, to median survival 6.3 months. So this was identified as a population at need. And indeed, uh, these patients uh, uh, would have a very poor chances to have a long-term long survival. I'm going to move to case number two. And uh, this is going to demonstrate uh, another biologic uh, entity, which is a disease which relapse post autologous transplant. So this is a 63-year-old woman with a, a stage 3B. GCB lateral lymphoma. This patient had a IPI3. She achieved a complete remission with a six cycles R chop, and in fact was in remission for a number of years uh, when she presented with a biopsy proven relapse disease uh, with a retroperitoneal adenopathy. She received a RISE chemotherapy and had a metabolic remission, complete remission, followed by the autologous transplant using beam conditioning. And then she had in a complete remission for a year, but surveillance theaters can at the time show that her disease has come back. And again, her biopsy confirmed the large cell lymphoma. She was not having semic translocation or uh, any other adverse features. So this is a patient who has an autologous transplant relapse. And when we look at in our center of who are the patients at the highest risk of relapse post auto, these are the patients who have a high IPI. So uh, international prognostic index um, uh, uh, of more than two uh, defines the patients, at time of relapse defines the patients with a high uh, chance of uh, having poor outcome. And also those patients who failed first salvage therapy uh, have uh, worse survival compared to those patients who um, are responding. And as you see, for example, here, the, the uh, overall cure rate with a transplant is about 40%, but this is a cohort which uh, spans over a period of 30 years. So the clinical scenarios with a poor prognosis are listed here. It's a lateral lymphoma resistant to primary chemotherapy. It's a relapse of lateral lymphoma which fail to achieve a remission with salvage chemotherapy or relapse patients uh, after autologous transplantation. Uh, the 
this is exactly the type of population which was and then uh, which was in uh, deemed uh, uh, as a necessary or a, a population at need and they form the inclusion criteria for the uh, CAR T cell therapy pivotal trial which were exactly de designed for this population. The ZUMA-1 uh, was a, a study for uh, AxiCell, Juliet was designed for uh, Tisa Genlau cell and uh, here are, I'm going to list for you inclusion criteria and we have to understand that um, the approval was broader than occlusion criteria but keeping the inclusion criteria in mind help us to understand the results and the success of this therapy. So the patient with a large cell lymphoma, primary mediastinal large cell lymphoma, transformed follicle lymphoma and a high grade B cell lymphoma were all um, eligible. They have to have a chemotherapy refractory disease defined as a no response to FLAS therapy or progression or stable disease uh, as a best response to most recent therapy or refractory to post auto transplant. All patients have to receive the uh, anthracyclase and rituximab-based antibody and they have to have at least one measurable disease. And we'll talk about the organ function in the next slide. So I'm going to really um, talk about another case. Uh, and the reason for this one is the patient was uh, deemed, he, he again had a 72 years old with a follicle lymphoma, uh, uh, eventually had a progressive uh, transformation and the ABC subtype was, uh, was, was found on a histopathologic examination. The patient had a frontline therapy uh, with the RCHOP and had a complete response. So this is a transformed follicle lymphoma patient. He was in remission for nine months before he relapsed uh, with the adenopathy. And at that time, uh, he uh, was uh, presented for a possible orthologous transplant, but given his age, he was deemed ineligible. So here I wanted to show you that uh, there are no age limit for the CAR T cell uh, uh, therapies and especially for the package insert and even for uh, the, the, the actual um, clinical trial. The important part more than the age is the function, Karnowski performance status and organ uh, function. So only the patients with the ECOG PS of zero to one were uh, eligible. They have to have a reasonable neutrophil count of 1,000 and plate count of 75,000. The lymphocyte count was also defined and it was really to uh, make sure that the apheresis is successful and there is adequate amount or number of autologous T cells. Uh, the patient have to have an adequate renal, hepatic, pulmonary and cardiac function defined down here. Uh, particularly note that EF had to be more than 50%, no effusions, uh, and the baseline oxygen saturation more than 92%. And there are a number of exclusion criteria, particularly related to the infections, um, the presence of the CNS disease was an exclusion in these pivotal studies. However, the patient uh, could have a history of a CNS disease as long as it was controlled prior to the commencement of therapy. And then any CNS disorder, such as seizure disorder or uh, cerebrovascular hemorrhage, dementia, or autoimmune disease with the CNS involvement were among exclusion criteria. I want to point out that uh, HIV, hepatitis B and C, all there, uh, these were initially an exclusion, but uh, I think these diseases are now uh, controllable quite well with the antiviral therapy. So for example, we were able to treat even patients with the HIV uh, successfully. So I'm going to go to uh, review with you the, 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 the concept of CAR T cell. So this is a type of autologous cell therapy. We engineer the patient's own T cells to recognize and attack cancer cells based upon a expression of a synthetic receptor on a surface. And that's here, uh, sorry, that's here. The synthetic receptor is the CAR chimeric antigen receptor targeting CD19 in this case. 
the synthetic receptor is on always on position uh, upon the ligation of the CD19. And the CAR redirects patients on T cells to kill the target tumor cells. This uh, signaling is also mediated through the uh, three, so, so three domains. There is an antigen binding domain, there is a co-stimulatory domain, which is absolutely necessary for function of these cells and allows ex in vivo expansion. And then a domain which is signaling into the T cell to uh, activate T cells to, to make the cells to proliferate and to secrete the cytokines and the, um, uh, the, the, the mechanisms uh, to which, which eventually kills the B lymphoma cell. So this uh, uh, CAR T cell uh, product is uh, turn in a turn on position, providing supraphysiologic uh, signaling to the T cell, which really results to a uh, uh, the CD profile which has been observed with this therapy. So how does this work? The patients are uh, referred to the uh, center and uh, identified as a good candidate for this therapy. Uh, they undergo apheresis where the T cells are isolated from the patient. The T cells are ex vivo um, engineered uh, by a viral transduction using either lenti or retroviral to express CAR T cell on the surface. Then they are uh, expanded uh, in the laboratory in a manufacturing facility and they're grown and eventually uh, are sent back to the center. The patients in the meantime uh, can receive some lymphodepleting chemo, lymphodepletion chemotherapy and then cells are infused to the patient. So here is the road to remission. The, there is a, a time between apheresis and uh, lipodepletion when the cells are being manufactured, which vary from product, it can be anywhere from 16 to 24 days. During this time, the patient may or may not require uh, a bridging therapy, a therapy where the goal is to stabilize the disease, prevent a rapid progression and allow the patient to uh, have be at the, the optimal stage at the time of the CAR T cell infusion. Uh, the, uh, I will discuss later lymphodepletion chemotherapy. At this time, we uh, better understand the uh, importance of the lymphodepletion chemotherapy and also the importance of particular combination of fularabine and cyclophosphamide. So everybody is uh, excited about the profound efficacy of the CAR T cell treatment. This is a, uh, another patient uh, from a different center uh, who was enrolled into Zuma-1 trial, who had had a primary refractory disease. You see a PET scan at the baseline with a multiple sites involved and, and a remarkable shrinkage, basically a lack of metabolic activity at three months. So this is a, a breathtaking activity uh, at, a, at a time where the patient really had no substantial hope to have a remission with the chemotherapy anymore. There are two products currently approved in the US for the uh, treatment of uh, the diffusal B cell lymphoma. First one is, uh, first one approved was axisaptogene silolel cell. Uh, this product is approved for adult patients with a relapsed refractory large cell lymphoma who fail two or more lines of systemic therapy. There are these four histologies I mentioned in the, uh, in the previous slides. And there's a certain target dose and maximum dose and a very low uh, rate of a manu manufacturing failure. There's a black box warning for a class for the both products which are related to the toxicity, particularly cytokarili syndrome and neurotoxicity, which I'm not going to spend much time on, but it's very important to really become familiar with this if you're going to use the product in your centers. The Tizagen low cell uh, is another second, uh, second product approved, again, for the refractory relapsed aggressive B cell lymphoma based upon the Juliet trial. And this uh, dose is, is way more uh, variable. So here is the difference. Uh, if you, uh, they, they are uh, targeting exactly the same epitope of a CD19 with the same uh, 
binding domain. They differ in a code stimulatory domain, CD28 for AXI and 41BB in a TISA gen. They differ in vector with a retrovirus used in AXI and lentivirus in a TISA gen. And then there is a new product, um, lisocaftagene, a lisocell, which is uh, undergoing, uh, you know, final, uh, final um, assessment by, by the regulatory agencies for approval. And this uh, particular product is using a defined ratio between the CD4 and CD8 uh, T cells. The products don't differ just on a paper. They are different in a several ways, especially the how quickly the expansion occur in a body. Uh, uh, for the axis aptogen, this is precipitous expansion. It's slightly more delayed with the tisagen low cell and also perhaps with a persistent uh, long term and also the toxicity uh, frequency. Here is the efficacy from the Juliet and Zuma one study. And remember these were phase two study with a relatively small cohort uh, about 100 patients each. The best overall response rate with the TISA is 53%, with the axis aptogen is 82%. However, the complete response is very similar, 40 to 50%. I would like to make one comment here, and that is a difference in uh, these uh, two studies as related to patients enrolled. With the Zuma one study, the patients were not allowed to receive the bridging therapy. And if you can imagine, for patients with a refractory of disease, there is a certain selection um, bias here because the patients with a rapidly progressive disease uh, are unlikely to be eligible or to really be able to wait for three weeks. Uh, unlike Juliet's study, where almost two thirds of the patients uh, received the bridging therapy in between the uh, atheresis and treatment. So here's the Juliet um, outcome. Uh, the study uh, demonstrated a remarkable progression of survival, particularly in the patients in a CR. Uh, the important uh, comment here again is that none of these patients had an allogenic stem cell transplantation or any subsequent therapy. The patients uh, who are who, who achieve CR indeed mostly retain their complete response status and those do the best. Um, there are some patients with a PR who are able to trans uh, to, to, to change to, to CR, and here is the survival for all patients. The efficacy of Axicel in the real world was recently confirmed by the uh, um, investigators uh, from 17 centers who piled all their data together. And if you look here and compare this stand of care axisel use with the Zuma one data, uh, of course, a way short of follow-up, but remarkable uh, similar best overall response rate at day 90, 81% in a uh, real world analysis compared to 82% in Zuma one and uh, CR rate 57 uh, in uh, the real world and 58% in Zuma 1, really remarkably close numbers. And uh, again, looking at the uh, couple Meyer curves, comparing the real world and Zuma 1, these are uh, very um, uh, hopeful uh, survival curves for the uh, axis cell showing the progression for survival in about 40% uh, here and the median time uh, median PFS is six months here. Uh, however, for the patients where the complete response is much better. So I'm going to shift and talk to you a little bit about what are the relevant factors to achieve the remission. So going back here, really, how can we push these curves up here and how do we select the patients who have the best chance to benefit from the CAR cell therapy? This relates to the patient, CAR T and disease characteristics. And with a the patient, there are host factors, clinical factors, and the immune system of the patient, which may play a role in how he responds to CAR T. For the CAR T, we have a better understanding that the intrinsic T cell health is very important and relevant for the qualities of the product. The CAR T cell construct 
uh, that matters and the delivery mode may be also important especially the timing and sequencing with the lymphodepleting chemotherapy for the disease it we talk about the tumor heterogeneity the target expression and uh, the lack of target expression or down regulation of the target such as cd19 the accessibility of the tumor and then a bulk of the tumor so I would like to review with you sort of like five key principal determinants of efficacy, which are based upon experience, some data, and, and some sort of a clinical judgment. Uh, we have the best outcomes if we treat at an optimal situation. We have to try to use better products, and that's where the research is going, and uh, new CAR T cell constructs are being developed. And there is also a, a potential a benefit of using the CAR T cell in the future in a combination. So for the blue box, uh, that's where we can really focus at this time. We want to focus on a patient selection. We want to focus on the quality of T cells and think about the bridging therapy, where really there is little, a, a very, very little data, but we have we as oncologists we can use our uh, judgment and experience to, to choose the bridging therapy uh, with the best intentions. I will review the lymphodepleting chemotherapy here and then very importantly being familiar and very well understanding the assessment and management of toxicity as it relates to the outcomes. For the clinical factors associated with the response, uh, there are IPI, cell of origin, age, these are relevant for the chemotherapy. Do they really matter for the CAR T cell? So here is the overall response rate, rate according to subgroups from the Juliet study. Their bar of the success was 20%, which is this dotted line here. And here are the different categories with the different factors. And we look at the, you know, whether there is a different hazard ratio based upon the refractory and relapse, IPI score, lines of therapy, molecular subtype, previous order, the um, rearrangement of the CMIC, the time from the recent relapse and the baseline tumor volume. And as you can see, really, none of these factors actually mattered. The uh, boxes are very uh, close to each other with uh, no overlapping copious intervals. The only um, trend is with the bulk of disease where the patients with a, a low bowel disease appears to with a high bulk of disease appears to have a um, worse response rate uh, but uh, certainly this is limited by the size of this cohort but importantly the the point here is that the cell of origin and uh, uh, the hits um, and other typical markers don't seem to predict a response to the CAR T cell therapy especially for for this particular um, uh, sub, 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 uh, product. When we look at the axi cell, again, there are different categories here shown on left. Uh, and uh, in a univariate analysis, there is no significant p value. So uh, suggesting that none of the typical usual variables predict or are prognostic for outcomes. This is from a real world analysis which also show that they are suggest suggesting uh, these five uh, variables may need to be looked into more deeply, especially as we gain experience in, uh, with the commercial area. The, may, the, the male gender, ECOG more than two, refractory disease, large bulk, and those patients who did not meet the eligibility for Zuma-1 appear to be have a low uh, response rate but still the response rate was substantial, ranging from 42 to 51, 51%, but there appears to be some trend towards uh, um, lower response rate in these uh, subtypes, subsets. So the question for, for, for you is that, what is that the most critical determinant to achieve response? Uh, especially for a patient like this, with a tremendously large tumor volume and still had a, a, a remarkable uh, response to the axi cell. So you have to have an in vivo expansion in order to expect a clinical response. 
This is the most important and for the patients who have a high expansion are more likely to respond. This is a, a PK data, the percentage of the CD19 CAR T cells per peripheral blood monocular cell in a, in a six patients illustrated here uh, with a rapid expansion in the first two weeks with a relatively quick decline and the persistence over a period of many months in most patients. If you noted the frequencies of these cells, which are uh, on the long term are very low, uh, significantly lower than um, one tenth uh, or about one tenth of a percent. In this very nice uh, paper from uh, NCI, they correlated uh, CR rates here with a, a persistent with the expansion of the CAR T versus those patients who did not expand the CAR T also uh, did not uh, have a actually response except this one outlier. Here is the similar data shown in different way. And um, the investigators went further and uh, correlated the uh, frequency or the um, concentration of the IL-15, which is uh, secreted in a patient's body in response to the uh, lymphodepletion. And as you see, it's very variable. The IL-15 peak is very variable in these patients. However, uh, the high peak of IL-15 clearly associates with a, a CAR peak, uh, as shown here, and that uh, this also reflects that the patients who had a complete and partial response have higher uh, concentrations of the IL-15 compared to those who don't. So what really uh, determines then the IL-15 expansion, uh, the IL-15 secretion? Uh, this is a study from uh, Fred Hutch uh, trying to answer this uh, question, which uh, relates to the lymphodepleting chemotherapy. And I'm just going to focus on this lower panel, please. So uh, this is the expansion of the CAR T in the patients who receive flu psi versus those who did not receive fludorabine but had some other chemotherapy. And uh, these are the medians with the uh, confidence intervals. And as you, and you, and you see, the best expansion of the CAR T cell is uh, seen in those patients who receive fludarabine cytoxan uh, chemotherapy, which leads to lymphodepletion. And I'm going to skip this and just show you really what, how, what is the current thinking about the role of a conditioning therapy and cyflu and how it helps with the CAR T cell expansion. So uh, cyflu are very lympholytic. They lead to lymphodepletion of the T, B, and NK cells, and they also eradicate the immunosuppressive cells, such as T-Rex and mal-derived suppressor cells. They also potentially modulate the tumor with the increased expression of the co-stimulatory molecules. But the most importantly, in my opinion, this lymphodepletion leads to a removal of the sink for the cytokines. So no lymph lymphocytes, there is nothing to attach to. The cytokines levels go up and the CAR T cells can use those cytokines to grow. So the cytokines levels IL-7 and IL-15 lead to increased expansion of function and persistence of the CAR T cell, especially upon their recognition of the target. So if there's a favorable cytokine profile, then we can have a better outcome uh, and a higher uh, CR rates as opposed to uh, unfavorable cytokine profile where we have a significantly lower CR rate and a lower PFS. So we talk about uh, uh, the, the lymphodepleting chemotherapy, and um, I like to move on to talk about the bridging therapy here. There's always uh, a lot of questions about what are the useful bridging uh, uh, regimens, and there is really not a defined strategy or well um, one patient fit all approach. It has to be individualized based upon what patient had previously. But these are some regimens which are uh, currently being used. We sometimes use a single agent chemotherapy, particularly cytoxan or gemcitabine. The GDP can be used since it's uh, relatively well tolerated. The goal is to avoid uh, prolonged myelosuppression, avoid toxicity, avoid risk for the neutropenic fevers. The GEMOX can be used, the RD have is slightly more toxic. We don't usually use it just because of the risk of the renal dysfunction. 
rice, most patients already have the rice, so it's also less frequently being used. We very often use localized radiation therapy for patients who have a one side of the disease, which is the most rapidly growing. And we work very closely with our radiation oncologists. Occasional cortical steroids can be used, by they have to be stopped uh, three days prior to the CAR T cell infusion. And then for a non-GCB um, subset, uh, occasional ivrutinib or lenalidomide can be used to try to control the disease, uh, since the remissions here are often partial, but, but can be effective. So here is the algorithm for selection of a CAR T cell therapy in a patient with aggressive E-cell lymphoma. Here are histologies. The patients who are transplant eligible uh, uh, with a relapse disease, if they, are, if they are certainly, if they are chemosensitive and they have a response to uh, second line therapy, they move to auto. And here, uh, the CAR T cell would be indicated for patients who relapse after autologous transplant. However, for patients who have no response to second line therapy, here is the CAR T um, box, which uh, really should be used for the patients uh, as opposed to you to, to consider another line of a chemoimmunotherapy. For the uh, primary refractory patients, they would be transplant ineligible. Again, they can get a second line therapy, but if they have a refractory disease, uh, they would be transplant uh, uh, CAR T eligible and get a CAR T cell therapy. If they have uh, uh, they, they, for some reason, can be uh, CAR-T ineligible. Of course, we are always going to prioritize clinical trials. So here is how it looks in our center, the journey to CAR-T cell therapy. We are operating through the BMT, given that aphoresis and manufacturing facility is closely tied into BMT uh, programs. The patient has a consult with a cell therapy expert who assess the candidacy for CAR-T cell therapy, and uh, we pursue the prior authorization uh, soon afterwards, the patient underwent the T cell collection. Typically, we don't use a central line. Uh, most patients, in fact, are able to collect the cells through the peripheral IV. And for the um, axi cell, we use fresh, pro fresh aphoresis for the uh, TISA. Sorry, for a um, TISA, TISA gen, you can frozen your aphoresis product uh, while you are working on, a, on, a, on the shipment. Uh, the manufacturing is off-site, uh, where the T cells are reprogrammed, and at the time we individualized and we use bridging therapy. In about 16 to 21 days, the CAR T cell uh, arrive to a center. The patients receive lymphodepleting chemotherapy, usually outpatient, and then we admit the patient to the to the hospital for CAR T cell infusion and keep them there for about a week. There is a need for a very, very close monitoring, especially uh, for the first 28 days. The patients need to stay close to the center within 30 minutes of a drive, just because the toxicities are sometimes rapidly progressing and they require a very vigilant monitoring and therapy. These are mostly related to CRS and neurotoxicity, and I'm not covering those here, but it's very important to, to be aware uh, another toxicity is B-cell aplasia, cytopenia, stomolysis syndrome, and of course, uh, some um, uh, infusion or immune reactions. So in the US, the CAR T cells are restricted and, cert uh, and only administered in the centers which are certified uh, based upon a risk and evaluation mitigation strategy. And it uh, requires to have a tocilizumab on site, two doses for each patient, the patient needs to be uh, aware of the toxicity and agree to the treatment. We need to uh, have a developed uh, a system where the patients are assessed daily for toxicity and admitted to the hospital for management if they develop high-grade CRS. So to conclude, um, I hope that I uh, was able to, to, to show you some um, or convince you about the, the utility of a CAR T cell therapy in the context of uh, currently available other treatments, as, as this therapy truly has a rapid response rate and improves survival in patients with refractory relapse disease. Uh, CRS is a serious toxicity, and I think that we have to learn more. There is absolute necessity to continue to study the CAR T cell uh, in a, a 
research and also commercial setting to advance these treatments to allow us to use them in a more in a, in a more selective mode and in a safer uh, platform. So here is um, the end of my presentation. I thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer the questions. One of the questions I often get uh, asked when we talk about the cardiocell therapy is that um, whether, how do you select one versus other? There are two commercially uh, approved products for very similar indications. So that's a, a hard question. There is really, in my opinion, not a clear answer. Uh, the, decision is based upon uh, the availability of a product in your center, experience, the level of comfort. The mm, uh, ESCARTA is uh, sometimes associated with a more rapid development of the CRS and perhaps for patients who have uh, some comorbidities uh, may uh, have a high risk of uh, having complications if they develop CRS. Uh, the other um, interesting uh, point is the patient with the HIV, for example, uh, we were able to treat them with the axi cell uh, and, and not with the TISA gel. But otherwise, uh, the really selection uh, of the product uh, is based upon an internal comfort level. And I, I don't have a specific recommendations. The autologous transplantation currently is uh, used for patients with a chemosensitive disease. And um, the CAR-T products are not approved for patients who have, who have a remission with the salvage therapy. So there is an answer here from one of the, from the audience, if one can skip autologous transplant, even if the, if, if the patient is fit. So my answer to this question is, at this time, uh, the CAR-T is not replacing autologous transplant. It's only uh, approved for patients with a relapse refractory disease. However, there are several, there are two or three phase three clinical studies randomizing patients to autologous transplant versus the CAR-T cell therapy. These are the patients who only fail one line of therapy, so our job or our epoch, and then they are uh, randomized to uh, salvage therapy followed by the set of care autologous transplant. And this is a very important study. Uh, the, uh, it's challenging the current uh, state of care, which is to use the order for the uh, high risk patients who are chemosensitive. So the results of this study will be very interesting at this time. I don't think that autologous transplant uh, is, uh, it, it can, be, can be replaced by the CAR T. I'm waiting whether there are any other questions coming from the audience. CAR T cell, uh, role of the CAR T cell for the gray zone lymphoma? Very good question. Gray zone lymphoma is a WHO entity uh, which um, uh, defines gray zone lymphoma as an intermediate between the large cell lymphoma and uh, Burkitt lymphoma or um, other, you know, it is not. It wasn't amongst the defining histologies. And uh, at the same time, it is an aggressive B-cell lymphoma. So in my opinion, you could justify using the CAR-T for the gray zone lymphoma if you have a patient, if you have a histology which can 
B broadened into aggressive B cell lymphoma and the, uh, there is expression of the CD19. The aggressive B cell lymphoma category, which is in the package insert, can be interpreted more broadly than just the diffusal B cell lymphoma. So I do, I do agree that gray cell lymphoma can be in this category. I'm not aware of any anecdotal reports or specifics whether uh, any patients were treated with this particular histology. Another question which came online is any experience uh, with the second infusion? Yes, uh, there is experience using second infusion uh, from several centers reported their, 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 their uh, results and their findings. It appears that there is really a little expansion with the second infusion and even in those patients who receive lymphodepleting chemotherapy second time around, the expansion is not uh, as robust. In fact, in the slides, and I can go back there, and uh, I actually can, but in one of the slides are skip, uh, the Seattle group uh, described a couple of patients who received second infusion uh, who had absolutely no expansion. The other issue, I believe, is that there is a development of the neutralizing antibody. The CAR T is a chimeric product. It does contain non-human sequences and uh, proteins. So there is some uh, knowledge that there is, in fact, uh, immunogenicity of this product. And that may be another reason why the second infusion may not work. Uh, another question came online. In your experience, do you think that a patient who uh, is not autologous transplant eligible can go through a treatment with a CAR T without major risk than a patient from eligible? So the question is asking whether uh, the patient who is ineligible for autologous transplant potentially can go safely through the CAR T cell therapy. I think that uh, it is less toxic in some ways than autologous transplant. And if you prepare this patient well, that uh, the patient may be uh, well benefited from the CAR T cell therapy. It depends why he's ineligible for a CAR -T for transplant. If it is age only and the patient has a normal EF and normal cardiac function, normal kidney function, and his uh, functional with a good ECOG performance status, then I would uh, for sure encourage him to pursue the CAR T cell therapy. However, if the patient has a major organ compromise, uh, particularly related to the heart or lungs, that may uh, not be a fit patient for the uh, CAR T. Uh, the, some of the um, analysis is uh, indeed showing that a poor performance status and um, is, 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 does provide increased risk of failure. And this is related to the toxicity, which is uh, manageable in a healthy patient, but patient who has a compromised organ function, even a CRS and a fever 104 for three days can lead to a substantial morbidity uh, and uh, can be life-threatening. So it depends on why he's not eligible for order. But I would uh, be supportive of uh, assessing patient for the CAR T in that situation. There's a, another question that came online whether there is a long lasting aplasia after CAR cells. The answer to this question is yes, there is a fraction of patients who develop uh, prolonged uh, pancytopenia. It's not necessarily aplasia. Uh, the patients is more often reported with a uh, Kimraya product. About 25% develop long-term pancytopenia, and that can 
improve but can take several months. It's a bimodal. The patients appear to be recovering from the chemotherapy and, uh, and then in about you know, a month or so, they start to drop their accounts again and they stay past the clinic. Uh, occasionally, they can even require transfusions, but uh, often it is a, a pathetopenia, which is manageable with a transfusion and a growth factor support. The other uh, aplasia is a B cell aplasia, which is an uh, absence of the B cells and a hypo gamma globulinemia. Um, in my experience, this is really not as substantial as one would expect. I have patients who have uh, immunoglobulins in ranges from three to 600, and in fact, they don't really uh, experience uh, significant infections. But this is uh, one of the areas which needs to be monitored and uh, followed long term. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate everybody's attention. Thanks for the questions and I wish you a great day. Bye-bye. We are done with the webinar.